we've been asked to talk about the future of Asian studies, but I'm, as a historian, I always think, you know, the future starts with the past, so I will say a little bit about the past first. Um, I'm going to um, start from a somewhat different angle from the one that we heard about this morning, thinking about Asian studies more in, as it's, in terms of its position in the intellectual and academic world rather than its position in the sort of national policy agenda. But I will, towards the end, come back to at least one of the issues that we were talking about this morning. Um, I first entered the Asian studies field in the late 1970s, and ever since I've been a, an Asian studies person, there have been ongoing debates and roundtables and discussions about the position of Asian studies, the future of Asian studies, always with a slight edge of anxiety. You know, are we under attack? Are we about to fall apart or something or other? Um, and I think that um, ever since the 1970s and probably earlier, uh, there have been a number of criticisms of Asian studies that we've always kind of felt we had to defend ourselves against. Um, in the 1960s and the 1970s, I think those criticisms had two main strands to them. Um, one, and this is still around to some extent today, was the attack from the traditional disciplines or the critique from the traditional disciplines. So the idea that it was that traditional disciplines have a real body of theoretical knowledge on which they are built. Um, area studies don't. Um, and therefore, area studies lack kind of intellectual coherence. Uh, maybe from some people's perspective, they lack real intellectual integrity. The second uh, critique, which was around very much in the 1970s, was a critique of area studies in the context of the Cold War. Uh, the argument that Asian studies in particular had uh, come out of the US Cold War political agenda, much of its funding had come from State Department related organizations um, as the US tried to grapple with uh, issues in Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, now that um, criticism at the time probably had some, some validity, although it may have been pushed a bit far, um, but that probably doesn't have so much relevance to us today. Uh, then when we moved on into the the 80s and the 90s, I think there were two more strands of critique of area studies or, uh, in general, and Asian studies in particular, uh, that emerged with the rise of debate about globalization and post-colonialism and so on. Uh, one of them was the view of uh, area studies as being a field of knowledge through which people who define themselves as belonging to the West viewed the non-West. Um, the sense that, for example, in many cases, Asian voices were excluded from Asian studies, or if they were included, um, Asian scholars had to move themselves from their home countries to the centers of academic activity in the world, in the United States or Europe or whatever, in order to make their voices heard. Um, and I think there are still issues there, although you know, things have changed very much over the past few decades, but there are still issues about how Asian studies in Asia relates to Asian studies in other parts of the world. Um, the second strand of criticism that became dominant in the uh, 80s and 90s was, I think, a very fruitful one, and it's something that I've learnt a great deal from, and I think it's actually enriched Asian studies very much. And this was the critique that came from people like Arjuna Pajirai and um, uh, more recently Willem von Schendel and so on. So this was not a, a condemnation of area studies or Asian studies. It, it was based on a recognition that knowledge of specific places is extremely important. But what it did was to challenge the ways in which we conceptualize space and areas and to question the very reified notion that somehow Southeast Asia, South Asia, East Asia, or whatever, are natural areas that we don't have to question. Um, and um, 
what, uh, for example, our Padraigite workers, you know very well, uh, did was to emphasise how much regions are created, uh, made and unmade by human activity. So they're always changing. They're a result of processes. They're not set in some kind of cultural bedrock. Uh, another part of that critique, again, uh, perhaps very much in the work of Willem van Srendel, is um, to say that the traditional view of areas was actually very much based on nation states. So areas were seen as agglomerations of nation states. And that was very limiting, um, and that's opened up a way of looking at kind of all sorts of transborder connections. And I think that's been very much reflected in our discussions at this conference. There are all sorts of exciting new projects that are coming out of the transborder connections that are possible um, in today's Asia. Uh, also, we saw that, um, for example, in Prasenjit Dwara's presentation, the fascinating talk about rivers and how they connect bits of the region that we didn't see as connected in the past. Um, just in terms of how that plays out in the present, I just wanted to share with you one little thing that I've been doing uh, in a course that I teach called Rethinking Northeast Asia, which I've found enormous fun, and it's a way of trying to incorporate some of that critical thinking about area studies um, into teaching. Um, what I do with my students is to try and persuade them to think about Northeast Asia, you know, broadly China, Japan, Taiwan, and all that, that area, not simply from a top-down uh, bird's eye view, but from a bottom-up mole's eye view, um, and to do that by taking very specific places. So it might be an island or a town or a mountain within the region, and then over a span of maybe 200 years or 300 years, how has that one place been connected to other places? And how have those connections changed? And if you t do that exercise, you see how areas are created and, and uncreated and recreated. Um, and I found it a very enjoyable exercise to do with my students. They've written some fabulous essays um, out of this, and I think they've enjoyed it too. Um, but now, sort of coming on to the future, well, I think that the landscape in which we are operating now is radically different from what it was when I started out. I think it's changing enormously, and I'm going to say some very optimistic things. I think it's really exciting what's happening. Full of problems, but really exciting. Uh, what is transforming the landscape is, you know, it's obvious, it's not area study, it's, it's the whole of academia is being transformed, basically by three forces, uh, globalization, privatization, and technological change. That's creating a lot of problems, but it's also creating huge opportunities for Asian studies. One of the things that it's doing, um, and I won't talk about this in detail, but I just want to raise this for discussion, is um, it's challenging the traditional disciplines. So we started off with a situation where the traditional disciplines saw themselves, I think, very much as stable and enduring, and things like area studies as being rather marginal. Now, because of changes in academia, all the disciplines are being challenged. Um, my hypothesis, one of my hypotheses, is that because of technological change, the profound changes that are taking place in the way in which knowledge is created and communicated with the digital revolution, one of the things that's happening is that knowledge is becoming much less disciplinary based and much more theme based. Um, and the simple way of arguing this is to say, think about how you write an article or an essay in the days when you rely primarily on the library and in the days when you rely pr primarily on the internet. In a library, you browse by discipline. You go into, in my case, the history area, and within the history area, you go to Japanese history and so on. You browse by discipline. Um, on the internet, you browse by keyword. That brings you to themes, and it brings you to those themes in an interdisciplinary way. So I think knowledge as a whole is becoming much more interdisciplinary. And this is a good time for Asian studies to stand up and say, yeah, we've always been interdisciplinary. We haven't been a theoretical, not when we did it well, but we have drawn from 
dis theories from different disciplines. And let's celebrate that and think about how we've done it. Um, the other thing that I think is very positive about the digital uh, revolution, despite many problems as well, is the amazing way in which it's opening up scope for teaching and research across borders. So obviously many of us are doing this now. You can teach a course on Japanese history and halfway through you can bring in one of the leading Japanese historians from Tokyo on Skype or whatever to talk to your students. Or better still, you can bring in not only a leading Japanese historian but you can bring in a scholar from Korea or a scholar from India to say how they perceive those parts of history. I don't think we've begun, you know, I think we've only scratched the surface. Things are really going to change from now on. And let's think positively and creatively about how Asian studies can use this, not just to cross geographical boundaries, but to cross the um, walls around academia as well. I just wanted to finish off by returning to something that we talked about this morning. And that's this problem of um, how do you really get Asian studies embedded in schools? Um, I think we have a huge opportunity that we haven't been using properly, um, which is that all of us in this room have huge resources of knowledge on Asian studies, most of which are not being used in schools, but they could be being used in schools. Um, and um, what's missing is the link between universities and school teaching that enables us to make the resources that we have, which might be you know, photos, videos, uh, basic information on the countries we teach, and so on, uh, available to teachers in schools so they can use them as teaching resources. Um, I was talking earlier today with Anya Detman from the National Library of Australia, uh, who was saying that the National Library is very interested in developing something in the way of a sort of Asia Resources Centre that would help to channel resources from the academic sector to schools. Um, and I think this is a really uh, important initiative, one that shouldn't be terribly difficult to do, uh, but one that could really help to provide those resources that we need to do the hugely important task of embedding education about Asia into the curriculum right the way through from the beginning of primary school up to university. Um, and I'll leave it there. Uh, I'd like to thank Ian Ang actually for uh, inviting me to uh, be part of this roundtable. Uh, even though I forgot to ask her <laughs> exactly what kind of audience I should have expected and uh, also what, how much time I would have had to present. So I put together a PowerPoint that is way too long. So I will just uh, show you the title of my PowerPoint, uh, which is the title of my talk, <laughs> and uh, give you an idea of the main points that I wanted to cover. Um, actually, I was also very pleased uh, that uh, this morning we were all listening to the uh, panel on uh, uh, Australia in the Asian century, uh, because I've been in Australia for less than two years. Uh, so um, one of the, you know, when uh, Ian Ang invited me, I was really thinking about the title Knowing Asia, the title of this whole conference, and in particular the title of this roundtable, and I thought it was uh, a sort of intellectual provocation. This is why I add the question mark at the end of the future of Asian studies, and I call it a critical discussion. And uh, being uh, a, an historian myself and working on urban uh, studies, in urban studies, uh, I think it is a provocation both in terms of time and in terms of space. Uh, what do I mean by this? This morning we listened to Dr. Henry, who said uh, um, that uh, we are, that Asia is where a Australia's future lies, uh, and uh, um, I think that uh, really, I mean, this whole idea of the future actually is much more in the present or in the past, as we were saying this morning. Uh, there is an interrelation between all these uh, uh, discourses that we are doing now about Asian studies uh, and the positioning of one country in, uh, uh, in the century, you know, and many other discourses that we have heard in the past. So I think that uh, um, more than the future, we should talk about the present. Or uh, um, I use uh, Terry Smith in my work, uh, who is looking at architecture and urban transformation, and he uses the term of contemporaneity 
to talk about the interrelation in terms exactly of what Tessa was talking about, of globalization, privatization, and what he calls the info space that are interconnected in the, and showing us the interrelation between past, present, and future. And in terms of space, uh, I think it's very important, and this is what, what is in my presentation, actually, to think uh, of uh, the future of Asian studies, uh, yes, in Australia, but in Australia as interconnected with what is happening and what has happened and what will possibly happen in Asian studies in the rest of the world. And, um, I'm saying this because uh, uh, I think that uh, Asian studies, uh, and in particular in my field of Chinese studies, uh, I was particularly attracted by some uh, particular research trends and research projects that have emerged uh, in Australia, in particular in the last few years. I mean, if we think, for example, uh, of the um, whole uh, uh, possible introduction and possible use of Foucault in our scholarship, the work that's been done in Australian academia on governmentality in China in particular is, uh, has been of excellent quality and has also informed uh, uh, the scholarship on China uh, in other parts of the world. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, uh, Prasenjit Jitwara's uh, uh, pioneering work, uh, Rescuing History from the Nation, and how, for example, exactly the university where I'm working now, UTS, started uh, the workshops on, uh, that was before my time, <laughs> of course, on provincial China, and started really thinking about China outside the nation state, this monolithic entity, and so on and so forth. So I think that there is a specificity and uh, a particular ways of approaching East Asia in, in Australia that are quite valuable. And, but there is an interconnectedness in uh, uh, the way, what I call the ways of knowing Asia and the way we try to engage critically with Asia. And uh, if we want to produce knowledge about Asia, in Australia, but also in other parts of the world. And uh, this is a part of my personal narrative as well, because I'm, I'm from Italy originally, and then I lived in China. And uh, I worked in different countries, as uh, um, uh, you know. And uh, I've really um, seen uh, also this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this idea that uh, somehow there is this approach of China watchers uh, that, uh, and uh, the idea that you know, China is important, China is in the news, and so let's create a center uh, about China. And then uh, you know, it's a, the problem is that to have a center about, uh, I was at the University of Bristol, and I moved from the States to the University of Bristol when I got that job because they opened the center for East Asian studies. And uh, it was interesting actually because they hired three people to have a center for East Asian studies. And after two, three years, they started saying, oh, you know, we have KPI, we have key performance indicators and you are not really performing well. So we will rethink about the center. And uh, this is a sort of story that we see continuously. And uh, when, uh, uh, I think about uh, Asia and Asian studies, I think it, it really requires a kind of engagement that, and a kind of approach that I call holistic in the sense that it needs to be uh, an approach that is really um, looking at, uh, um, I, I wrote an article about this in 2005 uh, that was published in the Asia Pacific Journal of Education, looking at uh, uh, Asia and looking at you know, the countries that we are engaging with as part of the world. I mean, it, it seems to be a very, a very simple thing. I mean, to think of China or Japan or Indonesia or other countries in the world and not as uh, we have done for a long time or has been done in our field in a, for a long time as China and the world, China and Europe, China and the United States. China and Australia. But this is what, in my experience, I've seen over and over. I mean, I've moved from Italy, where my PhD was a PhD in African and Asian studies because of the old colonial idea that, you know, f for Italy, like many other European countries, Africa and Asia were part of this uh, block, you know, the kind. And then I moved to the United States, where in the post-9-11 climate in particular, 
was a requirement uh, for all the students, no matter what was your major, at uh, the State University of New York where I was working, to take a non-Western civilization course. So it was called non-Western. So, you know, the, the non, the, it, was, it was called by negation, not by affirmation. And uh, I was, so all of a sudden I was teaching all these courses of Japanese history, East Asian history, you know, uh, late imperial China, 20th century China, Korean history, you name it, because it was a requirement. So I was teaching eight courses a year. And the students, of course, uh, were not really interested because a student who was major was chemistry or biology, but they had to take it. And, you know, and then, of course, uh, these are called uh, credits. It's a credit system. It's like going to the bank. Uh, and you, know, you put your money into the bank, you pay the tuition fees, and you want a mark at the end of the course. So you know, we, and this was the response in, state, in many state universities uh, after 9-11 to this idea that you know, the students needed to know something more than the West. See, this, I'm talking about, you know, this century, not the century before. And then, uh, you know, when uh, I remember in 2004, the, uh, the president at the time of um, the AAS, uh, the equivalent of this association in the, in the, in the United States, um, um, Mary Elizabeth Barry uh, from UC uh, Berkeley, she gave a keynote at a conference in 2004 of the New York Conference of Asian Studies that was called, uh, uh, How Many People Are in Your French Department? Uh, that was, of course, quite a, um, you know, another provocative title to talk about the inequality in the academic world uh, between uh, scholars and resources that were used for, you know, French department or you name it, Spanish department or German department vis-a-vis -vis Asian studies. And uh, this is something that I think is very important and I think we should raise in this panel because I was, you know, I was very intrigued by many of the things that were said this morning. But there is an issue of resources and there is an issue of not uh, short-term but long-term resources that I think is important for universities and for governments, uh, for government institutions to commit uh, to Asian studies. And uh, uh, we see it also, you know, with our ARC applications here in Australia that we, we have to tick the box of the national priorities and we compete, you know, with anybody else when we write our applications and we have to demonstrate, you know, that our project is relevant for uh, the national priorities. And so I think that, you know, I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, Asian studies is relevant. Asian studies is relevant in Australia, is relevant uh, in uh, uh, Europe, where I was for many years, is relevant in, in the United States. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's important that, you know, we uh, somehow I think also we use our associations and we use our membership for the, to these associations to, um, you know, to really uh, make this case. Um, the last thing I want to say is also about uh, the, um, I was saying before this idea that, uh, you know, what has happened in Australia in terms of uh, um, Asian studies and China studies in particular. I think in the last few years we have seen quite a few centers uh, that have uh, uh, been created in different uh, universities and in particular the, um, our center at UTS. Uh, the new center at Sydney, the Center for China in the World uh, at ANU, and uh, that is inspired by another quite original idea of what Jeremy Bame defines as uh, organic China uh, or, or new Sinology. And I think it's uh, uh, very important that we, um, when we, when these centers are created, and even here, I mean, Tessa was already talking about it, the whole if you want, in many ways, problematic interrelation between area studies and disciplines. But when these centers are created, there must be, I think, a real commitment from these universities uh, for a long, as a long-term strategy. And also, uh, I'm, I was, I'm quite pleased, actually, by the possibility of collaboration that I've seen since I came to Australia with uh, uh, UWS, with the University of Sydney, with ANU, and so on and so forth, because I think uh, um, if we really want to uh, engage, to critically engage with China as well as with the other Asian countries, I think, uh, uh, you know, we really need to go beyond the, 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 kind of, uh, uh, the kind of numbers uh, in terms of, uh, you know, China is the biggest trading partner of Australia with 113 billion two-way trade in 2011. 
and uh, you know this whole uh, economicistic uh, and uh, uh, quantitative uh, kind of uh, approach to the relationship between countries, uh, I think has to be informed by culture, uh, studies of culture and society, have to be informed by um, an attention that is uh, an attention that is definitely interdisciplinary, is uh, uh, inter international and transnational, and is really um, requiring an effort that goes beyond the individual institution and uh, has really to identify, in my opinion, uh, uh, themes and uh, themes that are important uh, not to the single country, but are really themes that are important in the scholarship and uh, themes that, uh, um, to which we can dedicate really our intellectual endeavor. Uh, because I've seen, for example, uh, in other countries where I was before, that there is this sort of shift, uh, if you want, from, uh, you know, this, uh, okay, China is important, uh, and uh, all of a sudden we create a center, but uh, uh, we need uh, uh, to have, uh, what do we need to have? You know, we need to have, uh, um, a, a, we need to have an, somebody who understands political economy, somebody who understands international relations, and then, you know, maybe we, have, we need somebody who does culture, or somebody, and you know, and there are centers that don't even have a single historian or a, or a cultural studies person. And I think, uh, you know, and I've worked in many countries, and sometimes I found myself working with, uh, without naming anybody, but with colleagues who really thought that China started in 1978 with the Gaiga Kaifan, right, with the reform and opening up. And China, and when, you know, China before 1978 didn't exist, was definitely not important. And so I think that uh, this is, uh, you know, today in this conference we heard a lot about opportunities, but I think the, there are also challenges for us that we really have to take into consideration and uh, working together, not only in Australia, but also with colleagues from other parts of the world. I think these are challenges that uh, uh, we can definitely uh, take, uh, uh, turn into opportunities for us. Thank you very much. Well, I find uh, people at my stage of a career are uh, usually depressingly often asked to talk about the past, so it's, it's very refreshing to be asked to talk about the future. Uh, nevertheless, I will, like Tessa, I will draw on my comparative advantage of having a past uh, to just ask two questions, or ask one question really, what did we expect? What did we expect would become of Asian studies? And um, I thoroughly agree with Tessa, we didn't expect what happened. Uh, but two things in particular I want to focus on, which is of, of particular relevance to Southeast Asia. First of all, we did think we were you know, history was on our side. We were part of an exciting frontier. We had the passion that uh, John Ingelson referred to last night, that, that um, we, we had to turn Australia around, and that we would, that, that we would build uh, a knowledge of Asia. Uh, we would uh, uh, increasingly uh, provide expertise in the universities, uh, which would, would grow and eventually become mainstream. So there was that optimism. Uh, but there was also a, a somewhat contradictory uh, assumption, equally wrong, um, that we would be a transitional generation uh, that essentially helping to train the, the Asian students, or Southeast Asian students, let's say, who would then go back and, and flourish and take over the field in their own languages. So eventually uh, the field would become vernacularized, it would become uh, pursued in Indonesian, in Vietnamese, in Thai, and so forth, and our successors would have the job more of uh, mediating and translating from those languages. Um, so um, perhaps, as I say, they're slightly contradictory. Um, maybe if we'd really been convinced that we were transitional and that the future was in Asia, we would have spent more time teaching in Asia um, and publishing in the vernacular. Um, and less time trying to build Asian studies in Australia. But in any case, both uh, expectations were profoundly wrong. As, I mean, we've heard plenty uh, this morning uh, of the, um, the problems with the study of Asia, uh, particularly perhaps with precisely that source of, of a lot of passion and, and uh, uh, excitement, uh, the Indonesian case, uh, where 
it did. For, for some of us of that generation of the 60s and 70s, we thought Indonesia sort of represented the other, represented exotic Asia, the challenge, the, the thing we had to um, uh, somehow uh, penetrate. Um, but uh, how wrong we were, how, how changed things are. I think the, uh, the factor of being neighbors with Indonesia as the, as the sort of epitome of some of these things has actually come home. I mean, we, we thought of it as, okay, it's our neighbor. We reiterated the mantra, therefore we should know something about it. It actually has become our neighbor now in the sense that it actually is easy to get there um, and a lot of Australians go there. Um, but now I was sort of shocked to, to find that uh, young, sort of slightly intellectually ambitious uh, Australians uh, think that going to Bali is, is a ridiculous joke. You know, that's only what yobos do. That's where you go, you know, where you have the wet t-shirt competitions and, and drunken orgies and so forth. You misbehave cheaply. Um, in, in Bali. I mean, that, that could happen, of all things, to, of all places, to Bali seems frightening until you, you remember, I mean, how Americans look at Mexico. And uh, I remember when, when uh, proposing to travel to uh, Cancun to visit the wonderful Mayan sites that are right there in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, all the, you know, American friends look totally disbelieving. No, that's all about wet t-shirts and spring break and all those, you know, yobos misbehaving. Um, so that's, that's the kind of uh, norm, I think, you have to say, of, of neighborly relations, particularly when there's a difference of A, language, and B, and more particularly, more importantly, income levels. If the neighbor is a place you can go to get cheap, uh, um, uh, let's say, vices, uh, <laughs> then that's what will happen. Uh, and that we have to deal with. I mean, it's, uh, so things have changed. Uh, neighborliness is, is a, a complicated thing. The closer, the more familiar it becomes, in a way, the more, the more complex. Um, but sure enough, uh, a lot of things have not gone as we expected. If, if Tim Lindsay is right um, with his calculations, a smaller proportion of Australian university students today study Asia than in the 1960s when we began, which we thought was the dark ages, we thought we were going to turn this all around. Of course, the study of Indonesian in particular has, um, is, is at about a, a level of a third or a quarter of what it was back in what we thought to be the dark days. Um, but the other, the other thing is perhaps more surprising. Um, the, the vernacularization didn't happen either, notably in Southeast Asia. I think. Uh, Northeast Asia, of course, is, is a little different, but not wholly different. Um, the key, key uh, explanation here is, of course, the rise of English as a global uh, academic language, which has been uh, astonishing uh, in the last um, 20, 30 years. Global competition, of course, has become the stark reality in the world of research, um, and publication in electronically accessible journals primarily, almost overwhelmingly in English, has become necessary to academic success everywhere in the world, and certainly in Southeast Asia. It's happened uh, with increasing uh, intensity the last few years. Um, so the, the Southeast Asian vernaculars, to just talk about those as, as distinct perhaps from the Northeast Asian ones, have achieved cultural marvels in the last 50 years of, of inventing popular culture and. Um, playing roles that they never played before. But they have not, uh, on the whole, generated strong scholarly traditions. Instead, academic prestige has continued, perhaps more than ever, to attach to those who have studied abroad in English and who can publish in English and compete to foster international publications. So um, surprisingly, there is still a dichotomy between the serious academic work which is done in English and international uh, competition and peer reviewed and all that, and the domestic vernacular discourse, which is largely a political uh, sort of uh, public debate, but not of an academic sort. Um, so uh, what that means, I mean, it, it is, as, as others have said, it's our relations with Asia is part of the whole globalization phenomenon. The intensity of interaction is, is far greater, and I agree very much with Tessa, the, the internet, the um, technological change makes it much, much easier to be global, to uh, use 
um, examples from all over the world uh, in our research. Uh, we don't have to be parochial anymore when we address problems, and indeed um, the, the planet uh, is asking us to be uh, much more globally responsible. But on the other hand, uh, just as young Australians can go to Bali or Bangkok to misbehave cheaply, so slightly uh, older uh, Australians find it's their skills in English that are in, in greatest demand in, uh, uh, in Seoul or Shanghai or Tokyo. Um, already there's more knowledge than anyone can cope with available in English on the internet about the countries we specialize in. So, uh, I mean, it's like the, the doctors, you know, finding their patients have read everything on the internet. What's our role? Uh, as the gurus of, of things Asian when it's all there on the internet. The worst problem of all, and it's been mentioned a few times, is the appalling trend of Australian monolingualism. Um, slightly perhaps confused, obscured by multiculturalism and the, um, the evident flowering of, of uh, shop signs in, in multiple Asian languages in Cabramatta, uh, but, but this only serves in effect, as was pointed out about the ghettoization of, of Asian language teaching, it has only made it worse uh, for those who go through the Australian school system with zero language. Um, it's been officially reported, uh, I think, that uh, Australia's second language skills are the worst in the OECD, because the OECD does these sort of surveys, but I'm sure it's worse than that. Um, this, this study showed 85% of school students never study a language, and of course an even higher percentage of university students uh, are not studying language. Um, I think it's not just the OEDC, we must be the lowest in the world, uh, because the only, the only competitors really are, are our fellow English-speaking countries. Everybody else studies English, and that many, most of them study our local language as well as the national language, so mostly have three languages. Um, but the English-speaking countries, again, if you look at them, um, English, um, those in Britain are partly redeemed by the proximity of Europe, those in uh, Canada by French, those in the US by Spanish. Um, we are not, uh, perhaps even Kiwis by Maori, but uh, I'm, I, I must move on. Let me, let me move uh, to, uh, I mean, this, this is the, the big issue, uh, our monolingualism, and I think all the other problems that we face in the uh, decline of Asian studies would be, would be uh, addressed if we could get this right, if we could get a language requirement, such as they have as the US uh, at, at all kinds of levels, if we could get students into uh, Asia at an early level, if we could get use our, our migrant communities effectively at the primary level and the preschool level as language uh, mediators and instructors for uh, the majority. Three, uh, four perhaps points to the future. First, uh, le learn languages in Asia. We need to vastly in increase the amount of Australians going abroad. It's been, the point's been made elsewhere. I believe uh, the numbers of Australians going abroad, and particularly the numbers going to non-English speaking countries, are again about the lowest uh, in the OECD. It's, it's extraordinarily low. Um, only 3% of Australians live outside Australia, and almost all of those in English speaking countries. Um, this has to change, and, and uh, carrots have to be used creatively to ensure that it happens. Second point um, of advice, in a way, get your first academic job in Asia particularly if you haven't actually studied in Asia. I mean, in the, the, the future generations will study in Asia, they must, uh, and in a way, everybody else has got this message. The way to flourish in a globalized world is to study abroad. Australians tend to do this much less than they used to, I mean, oddly, um, but uh, this is part of our, the punishment of, of, of the lucky country, of our relative prosperity. Um, but if, if you can't do that, if you can't get part of your education, uh, in Asia, at least get your first job there. There's a huge expanding market for uh, those who can uh, teach in English, particularly if they're uh, also um, culturally and, and linguistically equipped to cope. Um, so the, the, because of this sort of interaction, the, the Australian Asianists of the future will be a kind of broker, uh, a kind of manager of the uh, much more intense traffic between Asia and Australia than that we have today. Um, 
Uh, thirdly, uh, accept and indeed seek a broadening of the disciplinary base of Asian studies. I seem to remember saying this 20 years ago, so it's nothing terribly new, but it, it, it's, it's strikingly happening in our times. More and more people are studying Asia, but there's a certain uh, collapse of what we used to think of as the core of Asian studies, the language, literature, history, anthropology core uh, is, is diminishing. But then we find people in law, in architecture, in environmental studies, in architecture, I mean, you name it, people are finding that to advance in their career, uh, they have to take Asia on board. I mean, they'd be stupid not to. Whatever field you're in, Asia is where the action is. So in a sense, as, as Tessa says, the future is exciting. The future is, is wonderfully exciting, but it is hard to see how we uh, retain uh, the coherence of what Asian studies is. Um, and that's my fourth point. Um, despite the expansion of the study of Asia, Asian studies as a coherent enterprise may fragment. It may shift to being some sort of administrative device within universities to organize language teaching and, and the acquisition of knowledge in, in especially, say, non-European scripts. Um, but um, we, we will also need um, and this, there will also be a fragmentation, I think, on a, on a country or language basis because the, the, just the intensity of our interaction with a prospering Asian middle class, uh, with China, with Japan, with Vietnam, with Indonesia, with each of them will be so intense that we will need bilateral organization of a, a high level and a fairly intense level of regular meetings, regular conferences together like this. I mean, the, the idea of having conferences of us rather than with them, as it were, will diminish. Um, we will need to do much more of that. Uh, and so I think the ASAA will have to uh, not resist, but rather encourage the formation of bilateral country-to-country um, -country committees and, and, and uh, uh, conferences and so forth. Uh, within the general umbrella of a broader Asian studies room. Thank you. Well, I want to, <clears throat> good afternoon everyone. I want to begin by thanking Putin the Jin for inviting me to Sydney and this 2012 biennial conference of the ASAA. And uh, as he mentioned at the dinner last night, uh, last year when I was president of the AAS in North America, we had discussed finding a way for the two associations to work together when possible and for officers on either side to visit conferences organized by the other side seemed a good way uh, to get to know each other a bit, a bit better. So I'm here in part in such an ambassadorial uh, role and I'm grateful for the warm reception accorded me uh, as a representative of the AAS. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Judith uh, Snodgrass and her colleagues for assembling uh, such a fine and interesting program and making excellent logistic arrangements that have certainly enhanced uh, our participation in these events. So I want to divide my remarks uh, into two sections. In the first, I will respond uh, to the topic for discussion, what is the future of Asian studies? And in the second, I want to reflect a little bit on the lessons we may uh, choose to learn from the history of area studies that we heard about on the opening day. Uh, so I also want to say a few things about new directions and challenges for Asian studies in the university along the lines of things that my predecessors, especially Tessa and Tony, have already brought up. So what is the future of Asian studies looking like from where I live and work? I have no hesitation in saying it looks bright. There can be a number of measures that could be used to support that claim. And we surely should discuss and debate that claim and ways to assess it in what might follow in the time that we have. I would like to start with my immediate experience with the AAS, where I have been on the board uh, since 2009 and president to last summer. Several years ago, as recently as the mid-2000s, a familiar lament at the AAS emphasized three points. One, that the membership was aging and not growing in numbers. Two, social sciences and scholarship on contemporary Asian affairs were poorly represented at the conference. And for that matter, in the other work of the association, like its book awards and publications and so forth. 
And thirdly, sorry, international participation in the conference was low. In those so seven, eight, ten years ago, it was less than 10 percent. So I'm happy to report that in Honolulu 2011, the AAS had a historic uh, joint conference with the ICAS. And in this ambitious collaboration, uh, we immediately jump-started the greater international participation, addressing point number three. About 40% of those attending came from outside North America, and at least half that number came from Asia. The AAS actually spurred this increase by tripling its annual budget for travel stipends for scholars from Asia. Of the over 5,000 participants in Honolulu 2011, and of the over 3,500 who came to Toronto in 2012, uh, the first time, incidentally, that the AAS actually met outside the US was Toronto 2012. Close to 20% of the attendees were graduate students. That is what you, I heard you refer to as postgraduate students. Uh, the AAS has stimulated this reversal of the aging process with increased travel stipends for students, awards for student papers, and a very successful dissertation workshop that is now in its fourth year and its first year, actually, in a collaboration with the Social Science Research Council. In 2011, the total membership of the association had exceeded 8,000 for the first time in its history. And we are encouraged to see that this growth in membership has come from new enrollments of students and early career scholars. Thus, not only the average age of the conference attendees, but also of, its, of the membership is going down. So through a variety of policies that have been adopted in the last five years, the participation of social scientists has been increased, and even people from the policy world, media, public affairs, are joining panels in greater numbers, giving keynotes, speaking at special events that might be held in conjunction with the main conference. So this robust sort of reconfiguration of the AAS, I would argue, is one useful indicator of the wider growth of academic Asian studies and the greater interaction between scholarship and broader currents of interest in Asia in this millennium. We could discuss other indicators too, like the growth in Asian studies jobs in the academy, the boom in particular in China studies across even small colleges, even two-year colleges, or the community colleges as they're called in America, and the rapid increase in the study of Chinese and to a lesser extent even languages like Hindi in high schools across America, I should add that while there is a spurt in China studies that will likely increase the gap between China studies and the rest of Asian studies, there is also very healthy growth in Southeast Asian studies and South Asian studies. One of the most interesting trends, and but I think it's still early days on this one, is the discovery of mutual interest between Asian American studies and Asian studies. And we can see this at all levels, from undergraduate course selection that is, the kind of courses undergraduates are selecting, to the kinds of research that's being undertaken by new generations of scholars who are, work in programs like diaspora studies or American ethnic studies. I could add that submissions to the Journal of Asian Studies are up dramatically since the last decade, and that journals like JAS and Critical Asian Studies are becoming more influential through their impact factors. Looking beyond the sphere of influence of the AAS, we would need to focus on changes in Asian studies at universities and colleges. For that, it may be more useful actually to disaggregate Asian studies and consider the changing fate of regional studies within Asia. And I think this also goes to the point that Tony Reid was making about increasing uh, possibility of fragmentation, as he put it, but I would rather call it disaggregation, bilateral, deepening of bilateral programs through maybe country-focused centers at the universities and uh, bilateral academic collaborations between uh, scholars, say, in this case, based in the US and based in particular Asian countries. Uh, <clears throat> largely through the stimulus that has been provided by the changing demography of college-going students, the remarkable rise of Asian Americans in the college classroom in many parts of the US and the private giving to higher education by Asian and Asian American donors, I think we can see a rise in Korean studies, India studies, and China studies, while Japan studies and Southeast Asian studies uh, have seen less noticeable growth for some of these reasons in the last decade or so. But let me leave this topic here and turn to the question of what learning is taking place or not from the history of Asian studies and how quickly we may be adapting and responding to the new kinds of interest 
in Asian studies and in new ways of doing research and teaching that uh, Tessa also mentioned. So, so what could we learn from earlier generation of Asian studies that were discussed is specifically actually in, by Lily Kong in her very comprehensive presentation of the history of the field uh, in her opening uh, remarks, I mean opening keynote address. Uh, one of the things is, uh, I think we should remember is uh, interest in classical civilizations arising, uh, perhaps in some instances from colonial perspectives that might have informed things like Sinology or Indology, actually led to a body of work that focused on pre-modern periods and deepened humanistic study of Asia, even as that study was poorly integrated into the Western canon uh, of the humanities and may have been uh, benefited by uh, funding that largely came out of investments made in, in what uh, Tess also pointed out, the Cold War concerns. So uh, certainly a, an unexpected uh, benefit of those investments, uh, both in terms of enriching pre-modern studies and the study of the humanities. The willingness of scholars across the humanities and social sciences to collaborate despite their uh, disciplinary divergences I think was exemplary, and today it seems like a bit of a lost art. Uh, if you think about how effectively economists and political scientists and anthropologists and historians actually manage to work together for in what you might call the first decades of area studies, and it was extremely useful for the field. And uh, this, there was a common commitment uh, among these people to field work and language learning, even if it came with a certain national territorial orientation in the questions that were being asked. Uh, while uh, post-colonial theory, cultural studies, and transnational or globalization studies offered valid critique of earlier area studies frameworks, it is doubtful if they offered equally robust methodological shifts that were useful to the redefinition of area studies. At least for two decades, from mid-1980s through the mid-2000s, the move into new modes of studying the world outside Euro-America seemed to assume they would replace area studies rather than reshape it. And that said, the study of diaspora, networks, flows, and shared trajectories, both in relation to Euro-America and each other, I think did become new tools and directions for research. So I think it's only now that we are learning from that period in terms of what might be some of the new concepts and methods that are, can profitably be used and deployed in reshaping, revitalizing area studies. Thirdly, to what extent have older questions about nation states and economic development remained salient or even gained new relevance? And uh, the growth of Asian economies since the 1980s China, 1990s India, and 2000s Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and so forth, indicates that classical, uh, classic struggles for natural resources like land, food, energy, minerals, and fresh water are actually re-emerging with Asian neighbors now possibly as competitors. New connections are being formed between Asia and Africa, Asia and Latin America, as well as Asia and Europe or Australia or New Zealand. Asian giants threaten to reproduce a 21st century version of the scramble for Africa, but we also see a refocus of Europe and Australia on Asia to provide industrial goods and knowledge or technical services to growing Asian middle classes. And this last fact promises to generate unprecedented exchange of educated youth between Asia and Euro-America, and this might be producing a growing group, perhaps a question mark, a growing group of consumers of some kind of an Asian sensibility. Four, what are the implications of the rise of liberal arts education in Asia? And I mean, this is something uh, to which Lily Kong spoke very specifically, giving the example of the, the NUS college that's coming up in Singapore, for instance. And uh, I think uh, two things to be mentioned here. One is a regional perspective on Asia studies uh, has, is increasingly now incorporating uh, West Asia and the Asia Pacific as more central to a rubric of uh, Asian studies, which, uh, which is probably a good thing redefining the borders uh, of uh, Asia in that sense, uh, or academic Asia in that sense. And then uh, we have still 
to learn from, and this will only happen in the future, it lies in the future of Asian studies. Uh, the Yale and US colleges will only open in a year's time, but there are many more such things coming down the road in different parts of uh, Asia, especially in, in India, in China, and so on. And uh, this experiment with introducing liberal arts education uh, statedly in, in the sort of the American image uh, in Asian countries is, a, is posing some interesting uh, educational opportunities and opportunities to define Asian studies from within Asian locations. It's notable that one of the majors, very few, there are very few majors in the Yale and US college, only 12 or 14, but one of them is Asian studies. And uh, so the last point, and this is something to, uh, Tony Reid brought up towards the end of his uh, comments, is how do we make area studies more relevant to professional education? And I think uh, here, uh, whether or not, uh, it's really a question of do the core areas of Asian studies, as Tony was talking about it, history, anthropology, language, and literature, how they feel about it is actually quite crucial because whether they like it or not, business schools and health sciences and environmental studies and architecture and law are jumping in. And there is, of course, a bit of a divide there. Uh, there are tensions within these professional schools, uh, but increasingly the best of them, and most notably the health sciences and the business schools, are taking international experience and education as part of their core curriculum very seriously. And of course, Asia is a very big part of that. And uh, in many instances that I know of, they're actually coming to the core disciplines of area, area studies and saying, help us. And it's really a question of whether we want to join them in this venture and make it a much more interesting Asian studies for all concerned, or do we want to stand back and say, this is not really what we were set up to do. I think this is a choice all of us in the universities are going to have to make, and I personally feel you should jump in and work with them, because that's going to make an exciting future for Asian studies. So anyway, I'll stop there since my time is up. Thank you. I'm the sweeper, and the, uh, her, the sweeper has a great advantage of being able to move whatever direction he or she wants, forward, backwards, defence or attack. Um, so I only won't, will be five minutes. But I also, when I was asked to do this, I said, well, let's be a little bit provocative. It's not, not my normal style of doing things, as you well know, um, but we'll have a go. Um, and I think the question is turning on its head, and we need to stop saying, what's the future of Asian studies and start saying what do we want the future of Asian studies to be. Um, we are not passive recipients, we're not victims. We're, we're actors in a, in, a, in a situation out there. I have, uh, for, uh, over the years, uh, sat through a number of sessions where I've heard mathematicians talk about, the f oh, woe is me, what is the future of mathematics? In schools, universities, they're not doing it anymore. I've heard science uh, people say, what's the future of science in universities in Australia? And you hear Ian Chubb say it repeatedly. The latest one is English lit people who, lo well, and behold, life is dreadful because they're all being taken over by those dreadful things, people in cultural studies, media studies, whatever. And then, of course, the latest one to join the group is macroeconomists who sort of say, oh, it's all being taken. Um, and, and, yeah, we, there are, yeah, and all of it's true. And all of it's in one sense true, and it's part of the sort of uh, breakup of knowledge in a way that we, 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 uh, some of us are old enough to, to understand uh, how it was in the past. Um, but some of it's are our own problems, and some of it has great opportunities for us. Look at the way a medical degree is taught now, and contemplate the way it was taught 15 years ago, 20 years ago. 15 to 20 years ago, there were separate, you had separate pathology, anatomy, physics, chemistry, Mathematics, a first year, a first year uh, um, medical degree as long as 10 years ago was basically first year science degree, a bit more added on. None of that happens now. It's, there, are no, there are no uh, anatomy lectures anymore as such. There's no departments of anatomy. In, uh, they've gone. Because what happened in week two, the students are plonked out in the hospital and when they pick themselves up on the floor, and make a decision whether they want to go to week three or not. But it's all integrated, it's problem-based learning. When everybody gets together to work out what it is you need to teach a medical student in five years because the knowledge is so huge, uh, that it's, and the internet's out there, so we're going to try and teach methodology, we're going to try to teach a, a medical student how to get the knowledge they need at the time they need it. 
And so I think it's going to force us in the humanities to sort of think again about how we do things. Uh, I've said often to my science colleagues uh, when I've had the woe is me sessions that I still think in, among scientists there's a concept of education of open a student's head for three years, pour it all in and see if they can regurgitate at the end and we'll call them a scientist. But there's a bit of that in what we do too, if we're honest about it. The, uh, the, the, one of the crucial things we need to face as universities and, and, and educators is we've moved away from prior learning. I mean, genuine. We've moved to assume knowledge. You can do a science degree in most Australian universities without having done advanced mathematics. It is assumed you've done it. There's no compulsory courses at New South Wales higher education system apart from English. So you, you can enter a, uh, a science degree with uh, less than three unit mathematics. You'll struggle, but you can do it. The, uh, and we've abandoned assumed knowledge. Now, uh, when I was an undergraduate student at the University of West Australia, you could not enrol in an honours degree in the Faculty of Arts without having done one year of a language at university. What a terrible idea. I hated the concept. I had to do German for a year. What a useless waste of a year that was, except as a postgraduate student, I had to learn Dutch. And having done German helped me a great deal. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, in a sense, have given part of the game away that we have got, we've abandoned in universities the notion of any, any level of attainment people have to have to enter into advanced learning. So we're almost teaching people to count when they get to university. Terrible waste of resources. We, uh, and the, in one of the things we have to look at is it's, the future of Asian studies is a demand and a supply issue. In many ways, the demand's not there in the way it was because the humanities faculties and social sciences faculties are much more diverse than they ever were. There's an enormous range of subject matter out there for students to choose from, and there's still only three years, six semesters, four units per semester. So it is much more, it, it, the demand is different. The supply is also different because universities don't fund things according to how uh, necessarily the demand, they actually try and create demand sometimes, uh, often, uh, usually, and uh, they fund them in different ways and they usually use a bit of abracadabra and magic to explain how they got there. But they, that, so that we need to tackle the demand side, we need to get more students clamouring to get in through the door to do our subjects, which means they've got to be uh, I hate to say what students will do. I spent two years on ARC priority panel years ago, and Derek Schroeder and I, one year, sat down because the uh, waste committee of the parliament had got hold of ARC humanities. And Derek and I looked at each other and thought, well, we're going to get clobbered. So we sat down and wrote, rewrote the titles of most people's ARC successful grants in the morning and never told the minister we'd done it. But uh, because, and we managed to keep Asian stuff out of the Waste Watch Committee that year. But we do have to look at the demand side and we have to create that demand. And then we have to put pressure on institutions, the government, to, uh, to help with the, the supply. What are the, let me conclude by saying, what are the four or five things I would do if I had the magic wand to wave uh, as to what I'd like to see happening? I would like to see, oh, let me start, let me preface that by saying we are hit with a triple whammy. The triple whammy is this, that university administrators count what can be counted and measure what can be measured. And most of it tells you absolutely nothing about the, what you actually really want to do in education. But, you know, we do it and we do it and because outside forces demand it from us and so on, and on the game goes. The, the second part of the triple whammy is that we are in humanities and social sciences, which uh, is not the best funded component of a university. And the third one is that the funding components of to institutions and within institutions by the ARC and by DUO or whatever it's now called today, um, is, assumes that a a diving into a pool with a bomb from the side of the pool is the same degree of difficulty of a triple somersault and pike, and it's not. So we get three years and six months for all PhD students, irrespective of what you're doing, and that's quite not bad if you've got a team of people in a science laboratory doing a common experiment. It's a lot harder 
if the student's got to grapple with Chinese or Japanese or whatever it might be and struggle with working in country for some time. So what's, what would I do? I would push very hard for uh, the reintroduction of postgraduate fellowships for uh, student, PhD students to spend 12 months abroad. I don't care where they go, I don't care in age I'm talking about. Uh, and addition, additional to the three and a half years they get on their dual scholarships, because that is the only way we're going to be able to get that quality and that sort of, uh, we've had them in the past, we need them now. I don't know what the number is, but that's another issue. We need to uh, do something about uh, getting uh, more of our exchange students into Asia. It's not going to happen just by osmosis. It's not going to happen by us saying it should happen. It's not going to happen by Ken Henry coming out, it should happen, saying it should happen. As I said this morning, very few people do. My answer to that is the answer I've got to many things this morning, a bit of bribery. Pay and put forward some big scholarships to encourage them there. Offer them double what you'd offer if you went to the United States. You know, 18 year old, 9 year old kids are susceptible to these things. <laughs> So are 66 year olds. Um, so, but we have to do something radical. It's not going to change of its own accord by just promoting exchange. It's, got, it's, it's going to keep on going the way it's going now. I would do some, the language issue is a real issue. And, and uh, the, it's not going to, the, the review of the funding model that's going on at the moment is not going to do anything for us. Uh, I, I hate to say it, it's not. Uh, because the, and the pot is going to shrink, not get wide, uh, bigger, so that's a real issue for us. But what I would do, I've run, uh, managed, whatever it's the term, the verb is, two institutes for language over my life. Both Australia is very good at teaching English language, from uh, beginners to advanced, through to getting to a good IELTS, etc. Most universities do it. They do it outside the university, they do it through companies, etc. Uh, and they do it intensively. It would cost uh, the figure of about six million dollars. You could actually have an intensive program in a half a dozen or so Asian languages of 200 and 250 people for 50, uh, 1,000 hours or 1,200 hours of tuition. Uh, it's peanuts and we ought to be pushing for an Australian Institute of Languages. Uh, maybe one in each state, I don't know what, but we ought to be pushing for one properly funded to get people at the really top end that we currently, can't, we currently find difficult to get uh, in the normal way. And then I would have some sort of system which was an incentive, how a university is going to give credit for that towards their degree. I put a bit of bribery in there to do it too. And you'll see that all the vice chancellors lining up because you've only got to put a dollar between a vice chancellor and a microphone and they'll, <laughs> and they'll fall over each other. We've also, I think, got to uh, push very hard for um, long-term funding. This short-term stuff of let's fund a few lectureships for five years and the universities will take it over, we all know it doesn't work. That at the end of five years, universities say we can't afford it and they shut it down. Uh, so we've got to look for long-term stuff, and I don't quite know what the answer is, but the, 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 we've got to look for some long-term commitment to institutions to do something. On the research side, I think it's far more optimistic. Uh, I think the government, you know, but unfortunately the government will respond to what it sees is the issues of the day. So China's the thing at the moment. You can bet your boots that coming out of the Henry Review will be a big lump of money for somebody on strategic studies. Um, uh, and that's a, a sort of acronym or a sort of a pseudonym for, uh, yeah, we've got to study the people before they come and, you know. Um, uh, and if I hear any more talk about putting vast amounts of money into terrorism studies, I uh, will sort of throw up. Um, that what we have to do is try and push governments to actually put long-term funding into some sensible things, commit to them, but we will have to be committed. So let me finish where I started. We ought not to ask what is the future of ancient studies. You ought to say, what do we want that future to be? To become active? to decide what the three or four things we want to be collectively, to give and take and to get just three or four things. We can't go with a hundred things, but three or four big things that we all collectively think might change the landscape in 10 years. And if I throw in one thing to start with, uh, and I think I saw Ken Henry on it this morning, uh, was that if we gave out 500 scholarships 20 years ago for people to go out to Asia language and 80 
for goodness sake, let's go back and find out where those people are and we'll have some ammunition to evidence-based stuff to say, look, you invested $2 million, look what's happened. These people are working in really interesting things all around Australia and contributing to the nation and to the national economy. Thank you.